Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, blues man, Kenny Neal. Kenny, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. How are you doing? Hey, doing good. Good. Well, I'll tell good you, uh, I first became aware of your music back in 88 when Alligator Records used to do a series called Genuine House Rock and Music. Yeah. And when I bought volume three that had your song Outside Looking In, from that uh, first album, uh, Big News from Baton Rouge. Yeah. That was my introduction to the music of Kenny Neal. Wow, that was one of the first songs I wrote outside looking in. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? I still like that song today, too. We still play it. Well, it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It's not, a, don't get outdated, you know? Well, you know, and that's the thing. And uh, uh, now for you, you you just kind of just naturally came into into the music. Yeah, you know, my dad, Rayful Neal, who um, he grew up in West Baton Rouge, um, was my dad. And he and Slim Harpo, Lazy Lester, um, I don't know if you know Solace Hogan and guys like that, but they was all from this area. And they, they was the musicians back then. Ernie Cato, mother-in-law, and all of these guys, Johnny Adams. Um, they all come up together at the same time. So me being the eldest of 10, I was the first kid. So I got a chance to hang out with my dad when he was younger. So he would have me there uh, when they come to rehearsal. All of the guys would come over to my house, man. I had a concert at least twice a week at my house and it was just, I would look forward to it. And so I don't even remember when I learned to play because I was always crawling around guitar amps and, and drums and stuff like that. So I just grew up in it. I was, I was deep in the middle of the ocean. Of the <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say this, Kenny, I'm jealous. So I had to swim, <laughs> you know, I had to swim. I couldn't drown in the blues, so man. <laughs> It, well, it was a good thing because I knew from a young kid that I, this is what I really wanted to do. And I'm glad I pursued it. And, you know, my dad and my mom, thank God for my mom, Shirley, because she had 10 kids and all of us was around the house beating on pots and pans and guitars. And I would have been nuts by that time, man, if I had <laughs> 10 kids around me, you know. So I tipped my head off to my mom for putting up with the noise. She never would complain, man. Wow. You know, huh. we just grew up in the household of music. And, you know, um, when my dad was 19, 20 years old, um, um, he had Buddy Guy as a guitar player in his band back then because Buddy Guy and Phil Guy and Sam and all of them came from the, within 10 miles of uh, where my dad was brought up. So they all, you know, always buddies together and trying to learn how to play blues. And, and uh, I got a whiff of it and they passed it on to me and here I am carrying the torch. Well, you know, that's one of the things that I love about the blues is the fact that traditions aren't lost and the, the respect, you know, and honoring of the musicians that came generations before are still revered. Yeah. You know, that's amazing you would say that because I went back to my hometown um, a few weeks ago, a little country town where I grew up at, and they all love me. They all know me. I never change anything. I'm, you know, I'm Kenny Neal to the public, but I'm Kenny Ray when I get home. <laughs> they, they use my middle name. Hey, Kenny Ray. You know, <laughs> so if you call me Kenny Ray, you really know me. Um <laughs> So th these elderly people who grew up with my dad and knew my dad real well and used to go see him perform, they was totally amazed that I was singing these songs and playing the harmonica just like my dad used to play. And they were saying, man, it's so happy to see that you took this on. We thought once your dad was gone, it was over with. 
I go, no, it's a long ways from being over because I got two generations under me that's <laughs> carrying it on as well. <laughs> you know, so the the blues lives on with the Neil family. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned a harmonica. Now I had read that you were just three when Slim Harpo gave you your first harp. Yeah, I was uh, I was a little older than three because I remember it too well. Uh, I think I was somewhere around five or six at that time. Because um, he and my dad used to trade cars. They used to borrow each other cars, which back in them days, it was Cadillacs, you know, with a, with a U-Haul trailer behind it. <laughs> <laughs> well, not a U-Haul, but a trailer, you know. Right, right. U-Haul trailer. And uh, one day Slim brought the trailer over to my dad so my dad could use it for his gig for the weekend or something like that. And... Uh, Slim was playing a joke on me. He decided he'd tell me to go look for some equipment in the trailer. And when I got inside, he closed the doors on me. <laughs> and, and I hated him from that day on. <laughs> <laughs> he tried his best. He tried his best to make up. I was freaking out in the trailer. <laughs> he went to his car and he got a harmonica oh son i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i apologize he felt real bad this guy uh, you know and so he he had me a harmonica and that did it he gave me that harmonica and i snatched it out of his hand and ran in the backyard i still didn't want to see him i wanted the harmonica <laughs> <laughs> now do you still have that harmonica no i don't have it anymore but man i remember that like it was yesterday and uh you know and then we got to you know i got older and got a chance to know him and then he he had a heart attack and passed away at a very young age and and when he passed he had this record scratch my back that my dad really liked and my dad did that song in honor of slim harpo for the rest of his life Every night we would hit the stage, that song was played, you know, and, and I still do it myself. Sometimes when I reminisce, I'll tell my band, hey, let's do Scratch My Back. And, you know, and that's just to, just to give me my dose that I need as well. Yeah. Now, now you were young when you started you know, playing uh, with your dad in the band, correct? Oh, very young, man. I was like 11, 12, 13 years old. I was gigging. And I found out that... uh I can make money gigging. So it was like, oh, this is what I want to do. They're going to pay me for this? <laughs> I'm in. And, you know, and a lot of times I used to uh, I used to come home with more money than the band members because I was a young kid and everybody would bring me to their table and pinch me on the jaw. You did a great <laughs> job. Here's $2, you know, and I'll leave there with two pockets full of money in each pocket, you know go home and count my money you know? <laughs> so uh, I was look forward to the matinees on Sundays and uh, weekends my dad would take me out when I wasn't in school you know? but uh, yeah. I, I grew up for a long time I didn't know what I played because whatever musician my dad needed for that weekend that's what I had to do so people would say what do you play in the band I say I don't know you got to go ask my dad <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I am. I I might be on drums next week. I might be a bass player this week, you know, guitar player week after next. All depend on what he needs. Yeah, that worked out good for you, though. Uh, it worked out great for me, man. And, uh, you know, throughout the years, as the years went on, um, buddy guy called me when I turned 19 from Chicago. Uh, one night I was in the club playing, and his brother, Sam Guy, who still lives here in Baton Rouge, he put a little note in my top pocket when I got off stage. It said, call Buddy Guy. Oh, man, call Buddy Guy for what? <laughs> and so I go to a pay phone and call him Collect. <laughs> <laughs> collect call from Kenny Neal. You know, so um, he answered the phone and told me, asked me, he said, um, I'm looking for a bass player and feel my brother Phil say he just left Baton Rouge and say, you playing pretty good. We, we need a bass player. I'll talk to your dad. So man, I'm like, wow. He said, I'm going to be playing at Antone's on, um, on Tuesday night. Now this was a Friday and keep in mind, I've never been anywhere. <laughs> uh, 
And he's saying, uh, if you can talk to your parents and I'll call your dad and get your suitcase packed. I wanted to say, what suitcase, man? I don't want a suitcase. <laughs> so, so I went home and broke the news to my parents that night. And my dad talked about it the next day. My mom was crying and my dad was started packing my bags. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't want my baby to go. Yeah, well, I think it's a good thing for your baby to get out. <laughs> so uh, he put me on a bus that Monday, that following Monday, man. And um, I rode all day to, to Austin, Texas. And I was, um, you know, a little nervous about what I was going to do for, for rehearsal. And I went in that next day and went into rehearsal and all the songs that they call out, my dad had already prepared me for all of that stuff. All that little water, muddy waters. I had it down pat. I knew it like the back of my hand. So man, they started calling these songs out and I was like in my head, man, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> you know? I got this, I got this sleeping. You know? And uh, that's how it all started. I, I left home that week and it was so funny because I came back the next following week. Buddy had a gig in Baton Rouge. Okay. So I left home, nobody, and came back the following week. I was a big star, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're buddy guys. So we, we did the gig, and I had a chance to say my goodbyes again before I went to Chicago. And then I got to Chicago and uh, found out what big – big country city that was I was, <laughs> was kind of nervous about going to Chicago you know man I got to Chicago on the south side of Chicago but a guy had a club called checkerboard lounge on 43rd and King Drive and um, we was the house band when buddy would be off the road we would be the house band there you can come there on a Monday morning at 10 30 in the morning and the band wide open and rolling people drinking just like it was 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night, you know? So uh, I was amazed that this kind of action was going on on a Monday, blue Monday, you know? And so it just kept, kept me interested in doing things all the time. It, you know, down South, I had to wait on weekends to, to have fun and go out and play. Well, in Chicago, it's every night of the week. Let's say it's seven yeah. days a week, three, yeah, six. It, it, was, it was amazing, man. It was amazing to get to a city and say, "Wow, I could play on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday," you know. And then I would meet all of these guys, uh, like Fred Belo, you know, Hubert Summers. Um, oh man, just so many of them that I met. Muddy Muddy Waters. Uh, all the guys would come there on Mondays and meet up. James Cotton, you name them. And everybody was from the South. They was either from Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, and I was like, wow, man, it's like I'm at home. You know, I meet all these guys and they're from right down the road from here. So I felt really secure and at home in being in Chicago. And so uh, as I played with Buddy, I noticed people was getting contracts bands that wasn't very good at what they do they was going to europe and i go man how in the hell that guy go to europe i think i could play just as good as he could so then i started writing my own songs and putting my show together and looking for record deals it just gave me that idea to do that because i saw so many other guys was uh had bands and going all over the world playing I go, man, I got to get a piece of this action. And it, uh, worked. it worked for me. Well, I'll tell you, tell you to, to digress for a moment, you mentioned about, you know, playing the songs of uh, Muddy Waters and uh, whatnot. You had a chance to play with so many legendary folks. Uh, yeah. Tell us tell us about some of those experiences. What's that like well, when, you're up, when you're up there playing, you know, with somebody like a Howlin' Wolf for John Lee well, Hooker? You know, it, it was like, these guys saw me as a old soul because I was so young and I, and I knew the blues so well because my dad had instilled it in me. When I got to Chicago and they would hear me and the way I would play and, and they just wondering where I came from. 
You know, it's like I had that old soul that they fell in love with because I, I knew the music real good. And so when Lightning Hopkins used to come to Canada when I lived there, he didn't want to tour without me being on bass. When John Lee Hooker would come out and tour, he recommend, hey, uh, anybody could find Kenny Neal. I want Kenny Neal to play, you know. And, and so <laughs> that's that's was, quite the compliment, Scotty. So I, yeah, so I was like the the young kid that they they took under their wing because they knew that I had that special thing about the blues. So all of them become like an uncle or a father figure to me, you know. And and I I always respect them, of course. They, they always got respect from me and uh i was like another nephew or son to them and i and i look around my studio now and i can i go back and see pictures with me and big mama thornton me and bo dilly me and lightning hopkins me and muddy waters muddy waters and my kids together you know and it's just like uh when i walk in there i still walk around and look at these pictures even though they're my pictures and i see them every day it's memories come back when I when I see it, you know, so it's like my studio and a museum at the same time, you know, yeah, me and, me and Bobby Bland and me and B.B. King playing together. I just took all of that stuff that I had around for years and put it up into um, the first house I ever bought back 30 some 37 years ago. And I turned it into a studio and a living quarters for musicians to come here and they come from all over the country stay here, get the good food, and go in and record. So yeah. that was one of my dreams that uh, I made come true for to have a place where we can all gather and make music and not look at the clock. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I'll tell, tell you, yeah, uh, you not only have had this uh, amazing blues career, but you actually were on Broadway. Yeah. Now, how did, how did that come about? And what was that yeah. like? That was the strangest thing in my life, I think, uh, because I was so excited about having a record deal at that time. You know, I worked my butt off to get where I was at at that point in my life, which was, I think, uh, maybe the third album on on Alligator. So now I'm on a roll. You know, I've got two or three albums out on Alligator. And. I just got James Brown horn section on this album. It's called Walking on Fire. Maisie Yo Parker, Fred Wesley. And, you know, when I grew up, I was a James Brown boy all the way, you know, even though I knew all the Muddy Water stuff. And I, I did the James Brown so much, you wouldn't believe. And uh, to have his horn section on my album, I was delighted. And um, I get this call in saying that we want you to come to New York. My manager called me up and said, hey man, they want you to come to New York and audition for a Broadway show. I go, Broadway show, man, they must got the wrong Kenny Neal. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're not talking about me. And uh, he said, no, but I think it's you that they want. I go, man, I don't know nothing of anything about uh, any um, theatrical acting or anything like that. So. We caught a flight. We went to the Lincoln Center, and I went in to read that day, uh, that next morning. And when I came out, he was sitting there going, "How it go, man? How it go?" I go, "Awful. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was bad, man." <laughs> he go, "Well, you know, at least we tried." I said, "Yeah." So I said goodbye to the folks, man. And uh, Albert King was playing in town that night. And I got a chance to go and see Albert King play that night at the Blue Note. And uh, the next day we was on the flight back, me and my manager back to Florida. He go, well, you know, at least we we, we gave it a shot, man. You know, it's, it's okay. We did it. I go, yeah. I said, the best thing about the whole thing is that I got a chance to see Albert King last night. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even thinking about Broadway. Well, <laughs> About a week and a half later, I get another disaster call. You got the part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so much for not going well. Yeah. Just what I didn't want, man. <laughs> I, got, I got so nervous. I got so nervous about it because, you know, um, 
having that lead role in that play with 27 people in my cast, you know, your, your script looked like a Bible, you know, and then I knew I was in trouble. I go, I got to learn all this. <laughs> so they, they uh, gave me a, a coach by the name of Novella Nelson. And she was so great. She just passed a couple of years ago. But uh, one thing stick with me when she was coaching me in theatrical, she would always tell me to trust the moment, Kenny, trust the moment and you're going to be fine because she was in, she was getting something out of me. I didn't know I had in me, you know? And so she worked with me for about three months, one-on-one. And I had to read them lines every day for about a month. And then the next month she said, okay, now you're going to have to sing your lines, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, it was, it was a drill. They drilled me, man. She was like mm-hmm. Sergeant Carter on me or something. She was very nice the first few days, few weeks. But then she turned into <laughs> that it was down uh, to business. Yeah, man. But you know what? She did it. I won. I won the Theater World Award for the most outstanding new coming actor on Broadway. So um, I have to give her all the the praise for that. You know, she worked yeah. with me. She worked with me, and she started from scratch. And and I did it. And she was real proud of me at, at opening night. You know. Yeah. Now, have you, so you given any thought Broadway. to do that again? No, man. I go, the night they told me it was going to be closing, I went inside and I went yelling, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Back to my music. <laughs> Back playing my blues again. I mean, I had a lot of calls for theatrical uh, work. Actually, I'm going to be in a movie next week that I'm going to shoot here in Baton Rouge that they're shooting and they asked me would I do it. So this is going to be my first time going back to it since 90, whatever that was when I was mm-hmm. on Broadway. But I had no interest in going to the stage, acting stage. I mean, it was a lot of opportunities for me and I did well at it, but it, it's not where my heart was at. My heart was on the blues. And so I went back to the stage and played my blues music, which I was very happy with that. Well, you can't go wrong following your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's the name of my new album is going to be straight from the heart. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'll well, tell you what, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but I wanted to, one of your albums that I want to talk about was Bloodline. Yeah. Now that, you know, that was a really good album and that thing won a lot of awards for you. Yeah. I got Tell us about Bloodline. Yeah, Bloodline was, um, well, Bloodline, the song itself is was me trying to capture um, part of my history for my younger generation family that's coming along, can look back years to come and, and watch how we really did it with the Neil family. If you go to um, YouTube and pull up Bloodline, you'll see the Bloodline video with us out there balling crawfish with my mom and sisters and brothers and family and just having a great time the way the neo family roll so i wanted to capture that and um it was it was a it's, it's a record that i had a great time doing and, and making and writing the songs and just a piece of history and that's why i call it bloodline yeah now that uh you, you got the, the blues awards plus you got a grammy nomination for that as well Yes, yes. Yeah. It, was, it was good to walk the red carpet. <laughs> yeah. So well, um, you- I'm coming back again in 2022. I'll be back again with a with a new new CD, which I'm very pleased with it because uh, this one here is more of uh, my traditional music that I grew up with around Baton Rouge. It's not a Chicago blues or Mississippi. It's straight up Bayou, Louisiana. I got Zydeco guys on it. I have, I have Buckwee Zydeco band as a guest, and we're playing a lot of styles like Clifton Shania did back in the days. I got a lot of that coming. I'm doing the 50s stuff like Slim get, uh, Guitar Slim and all of them, and my dad, Rafael, that they – they style that they did in the fifties that we don't hear 
at all these days on new albums that's coming out. So this this record is really going to take us back. Great. But t- t- the 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 music out of uh blues in, in every in different place has got a different sound to it uh-huh. now baton rouge is kind of like a combination is of a lot of different styles blended into a unique distinctive sound yeah and, and that's because a lot of the guys who end up in baton rouge came from mississippi um a lot of them came from Appaloosa's lafayette area new orleans area and it's kind of a combination of all of that right here in Baton Rouge that they kind of twist it and we call it uh, uh, Swamp Blues. You know, that's our style, the old chicken picking. <laughs> <laughs> so you we got to love it. it. And, you know, uh, like like Fast Domino and all that with the horns and that's 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 the area I'm kicking at right now with uh, with my nice. And, nice. I'm ha- and I'm I'm really loving it, not because it's me, and I'm writing it. It's just I'm I'm glad that I can capture and still play that style, where it's, it's going to be around for a while. And all the songs I find myself singing and dancing to it, you know, I go, <laughs> oh man, it's got to be good if I'm moving. <laughs> I was just gonna say, <laughs> yeah, if I'm moving to my own self, you know, because uh, then that's when I'm separating myself and the music. And I'm listening to just the music, what's going on. And man, I'm having a ball with the horn players and everybody, you know, coming in playing that old style. And the horn players like it because they don't get a chance to play that style anymore. So. Yeah. Now you've actually got a, got several projects going, including you got one with, with uh, Tito Jackson, right? Yeah. He, uh, he called me up back during the pandemic time and uh, my studio, I, I had everything closed down. So he go, man, I've been checking around for people to help me with my project, but you keep coming into mine and say, and I hate to ask you to do this, but would you be interested in, you know, uh, producing some songs for me? And I go, sure, man, I'll I'll knock it out for you. So they sent me, uh, I think, 14 demos. And I, I got my engineer and we went in there with our mass and all the whole nine yards. Um, I had, um, I don't think I had my shot at that time. So we was really being careful about the way we, we was recording and we went in and did it and it just kept getting better and better. The more I did the songs, the more I got into them. And then I started writing horn charts for him and sending it to the horn players and putting it all together. And he didn't expect to even get what he got. He thought he was just going to get some some tracks with rhythm but he didn't think i was gonna go all out and put the strings and the, the horns and all that on so we did that and um, i finished it in like two months wow and then i did um we got this one song we just released it's called love one another it's out now on spotify and wherever they got it on social media but uh it's it's with me uh tito jackson um Stevie Wonder and Marlon Jackson and Bobby Rush. And it's called Love One Another. And the video will be out pretty soon to follow. Uh, we're, we're about 95% finished with the video now, so it'll be out shortly. And uh, the whole thing would be released uh, April, August 9th in a few days. All right. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Good, good. So yeah. uh, and and Stevie is playing some great harmonica on there and and I'm so happy that the guys of that caliber is ready to do contribute to the blues. You know, they they grew up with that stuff and now they're saying, "Hey man, we're happy you guys are putting a blues album out." And everybody, we got Eddie Levert from the OJs. We have George Benson on that on that album. Wow. We got we got um, we got uh, who that is uh, Claudette King. Uh, we got Joe Bonamassa as a guest on it. Um, we got Grady Champion on it. Stephen Powell. Um, so we have a, quite a few 
guest folks on mm-hmm. there. And I think it's going to be a great record. Well, it sounds good. It sounds good. And well, from, from what you've said, Getty, I don't know how you could go wrong with that mix. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got a nice crew, man. We got a nice crew there. Yeah. So I, I'm excited to be a part of this project, and it's going well. And now we are setting up a tour, so I want everybody who's listening to look forward to the tour. It's going to be Kenny Neal, Bobby Rush, and Tito Jackson. And it's being put together as we speak. So well, I hope back. you come through our back. area. I'll be back on the road <laughs> with, with that tour. Yeah. Good deal. Well, you you actually were had, uh, were doing more like festivals and stuff than you were tour dates, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I stopped doing the club dates, you know. So I did mostly festivals. Now I think I'll be doing theaters, casinos, and the festivals. So uh, yeah, good. I'll be around. I'll be around. Good deal. And, and still and still traveling with my family because we decided, you know, my family band been with me forever. So we decided to keep my family as the, the main band for this tour. And I, I will be hiring horn players to join us and a couple of extra guys. But I, I'll have my little brothers on bass and uh, drums and stuff like that. Yeah, good deal. Well, tell me this, Kenny, as somebody who started young, what advice do you have for uh, young kids who are just starting out and with their instrument? And uh, what advice do you have for them if if they want to pursue it long term? Yeah, well, well, number one, understand trying your best to understand the business. That's 50% of it. I don't care if you can play a zillion notes in three seconds. That's all fine. But learn about the business. Learn how to get your your songs published, uh, copyrighted, uh, and and know where you're going with the business. And if you don't know, I mean, there's so many places you can go now to get info. And please do that. And then pursue your career with your talent. Because, you know... uh, it makes a lot of people frustrated that's real good at their craft, what they can do. They're excellent musicians, and they go to festivals and look at other guys on stage as half as good as them. And they wonder to themselves, man, why is he up there? I could be up there doing that. But the guy up there doing that took care of business. You know, he followed through on what he has to do. So... Just follow the right protocol and, and, and look at business being 50% of it. Well, it's called the music business for a reason. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and and then, then you do show bidding. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, well tell, you, tell, you, tell you what, Kenny, looking back at uh, what are some of your fondest memories from some of the, the shows that you've done? Well, uh, man, I got so many, you know, when I, when I was on stage with big mama Thornton, uh, and she used to start off real nice with us and halfway through that jar, she used to have a jar, Mason jar with half milk and the rest gin. (laughs) So as she drank through the show, and we know what time it is when it, when we see half of it gone, we know we're getting ready to get a lesson. And it wasn't nice. You know, somebody getting ready to get cursed out. <laughs> Playing them damn drums too loud. Get down. Turn that guitar down. Get off the drums. I remember one night she made my brother get off the drums, man. It took her 10 minutes to get back there. <laughs> and the place packed. She didn't ran him. He fired. <laughs> Come on, Kenny, hit it now. Hit it. <laughs> uh, oh man. I, I remember uh I remember me and Rufus Thomas was doing the show. It was uh uh my, me and my brothers was backing him up. They had BB King there, Shirley Brown, buddy guy. Um What's that kid named Sean? He passed away years ago. 
Sean, uh, I can't think of his name now. But anyway, I, we on stage and Rufus singing a song about, give me some of yours and I'll sell you some of mine. And he, he was grinding, you know, but his, his zipper was wide open. <laughs> Stuff like that, man. You know, some of the crazy, some of the crazy moments, you know. Oh uh, man. I remember uh, I was playing at a place in New York called My Father's Place. And uh but a guy had just finished doing his thing, so he called he called Junior Wells up. And uh Junior walks out with a briefcase. So he don't come in front of the stage, he don't come on stage. He he has his briefcase on the side of the stage and he had a little bit too much to drink with the Tangeray gin. And uh, they say, Junior Wells, Junior Wells. And he was back there with matches. He couldn't figure out what harmonica he could get. He couldn't see. <laughs> yeah. buddy, walked over, buddy walked over to him and said, you better go help your buddy. He just scratched up three box of matches trying to find the right harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that was fun. You know, so we used to have little little fun things. But uh -huh. I had so many, you know, with James Cotton on stage, Bo Dilly, uh John Lee Hooker was the one that tripped me out every night because he was like almost a religious thing going on. I mean, at the end of the night they'd be mesmerized and eyes closed and hands in the air, and it would happen every night in different cities. I go, man, what is this guy got? You know, he just put him in that boogie, that boogie feel, and then he'd go off to doing his at lib stuff, and uh, it was like magic. Wow. You know, and then uh, you go behind stage, and he got two beautiful girls sitting on each each lap, you know. <laughs> I remember he sent, he sent me a, a Christmas card one year. I still have it. It says, Merry Christmas from the world's biggest hooker. <laughs> and I opened it up and it's a picture of him sitting in a chair. <laughs> yeah. So I still have that card. Oh, that's great, Kenny. That's great stuff. Yeah. So I have a lot of memories of so many of them, man. With Muddy, I remember being up with Muddy and it was just so exciting. I couldn't even figure out. I was thinking about telling my dad I played with Muddy Waters so bad I wasn't focusing on on stage. I was just saying, boy, I'm going to tell my dad I played with Muddy Waters. I hadn't even played yet. Because <laughs> Muddy was one of the guys he would always talk about when I was growing up. Him and Lil Walter was my dad favorites. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I was just so excited. And, you know, to be able to do what I did and come back and get my dad take him with me and and that was the most rewarding thing i could ever have in my life is that he raised 10 kids up he put his career on hold because when buddy guy left he was supposed to be with buddy to go and play with muddy waters and my dad turned it down because i had just i was just born at that time in 57 and so my dad stayed behind and raised his family which i'm the oldest of 10 and um, for me to go back and get him after all them years and have him go to Germany and Japan and France, man, I still today is nothing better than that for me. You know? So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, in, in the video that you mentioned for Bloodline, it, sh it shows how important family is to you. Yes. It's very important for family to stick together, man. I say that on my stage every night, love one another, stick together, you know, and it's important because I, I see so much stuff going on today and it's just so sad to see the way, you know, the violence is out there. It's just, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. And yep. I hope whatever little good I can do to bring people together, like this new song we have now called love one another. I hope that can reach folks as well. Because well, that's what music does, Kenny, is it brings everybody together. Yeah, man. And it's it's important. So, um, you know, until I can't do it anymore, I'm going to continue to do it until I can't. Yeah. 
I like that philosophy. That's it, man. All right, Kenny. Well, tell me, tell me this: Is there anything that we uh, that we didn't touch on that you wanted to? Well, um, you know, they can go over to uh, you can go over to KennyNeal.net, and if there's artists out there that's listening and interested and in coming down to Louisiana and coming to the studio, which is Brookstown Recording, I'll be happy to take a listen at their projects and give me a call or email me and. Um, we have living quarters where they can stay and get recorded. And I work with their bucks. I'm not a studio that said, okay, I need this much hour. If you only have a certain amount of dollars, I'll work with you. That's the way I'm looking at it because I know how hard it was for me to get started. And I want to be there to help the younger guys out. So that's what my studio is all about. You got your own label too, correct? Yeah, called Booga Music. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, it's just, um, it, it was uh, all of my songs and publishing stuff that I did throughout the years was always, my Booga came from me calling my son Booga when he was a little kid. You know, Booga, 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 playing around with him. Mm -hmm. So he, they still call him that when he come to Baton Rouge because he lives in Toronto, Canada. Okay. And, and uh, all my friends would go, Hey, when Booga coming? You know, I go, oh, I don't know if you want to be called that anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but you could call him that. Yeah, I can call him that. But then I call, I called the my, my publishing company because I was trying to find a name. And when you look for a domain name, it's so hard. Mm -hmm. Like everything's been swiped up. So I decided to use Booga and call it Booga Music. And it's been going for years, but so when the record company, when I started to do that, I go, what the hell? I'm trying to figure out a name for a record company for it. Just keep it Book of Music and made it simple. So that's where Book of Music comes from. All right. Yeah. Good deal. I'll tell you what, Kenny, we've had your website scrolling across the bottom of the screen at various times throughout the show, but it's going across right now. Actually. Oh, yeah, I see it there. Yeah. So, good, uh, so good. folks could, could uh, get a hold of you. Plus, they can uh, uh, link to all your music and social media and all that stuff as well. They come so down here in the car and I could feed them some of that fried alligator, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there Saturday, Kenny. There you go, man. There you go. <laughs> Just get some of that Louisiana food going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. Well, I'll tell you what, on that note, everybody, we're going to wrap this one up. Kenny, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, everybody, I want to thank you for watching. Have a good night. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content without the express written consent of Starliner Media is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.